to stand as we begin our Sunday morning worship. If you're watching by the way of web, welcome to the presence of God. The writer in the book of Psalms says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Has He been good to you? Let's reach out today and just taste of Him just a little bit. God, we reach out to you. We lift up your name. We magnify you. God, we love you this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence that fills this house. Oh, God, it feels so good to reach out and touch you this morning as your presence fills this place. God, we have come to worship you. We have come to lift up your name and magnify you this morning. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. His presence fills his house this morning. Let's worship with our singer. Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no
Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty king. Worthy is the lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who's overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty king. Worthy is the lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who's overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty king. Worthy is the lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who's overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. He's alive. He's alive. glad he's alive this morning he's still living he's still able he is still moving in our lives oh praise God praise the Lord man let's let's worship the Lord let's let's bring our needs before him we'll put our we'll put our request on the board and if you need prayer for your body you are more than welcome to come forward and our elders will anoint you with oil and pray with you and right now if you have a need, let it be known by an uplifted hand. And we're going to worship the Lord and thank Him for what He's going to do. Lord, we love You and we praise You, Jesus. We thank You, Lord, for how Your Spirit is moving among us this morning, God. Lord, we thank You that there's no grave that can hold us down, Lord. Lord, You're able to see us through every storm, God. Lord, You can slay every giant, Lord. There is nothing this world can throw at us, God, that can separate us from your love, Jesus. Lord, so long as we trust in you, God, we thank you that you are faithful to see us through, God. Lord, you provide us with healing, God. You provide us with financial blessings, Lord. You heal our relationships, God. Lord, you move like no one else can move, God. Lord, you part seas, God, and move mountains. Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing in this place, God. We worship you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You're the God of miracles. power we believe in your power you're the god of miracles signs and wonders we believe in your power we believe in your power you're the god of miracles signs and wonders we believe in your power we believe in your power
Savior. Claim it over your life. You're, you're a miracle, miracle worker. Claim it over every situation, every disease. You're, you're a miracle, miracle worker. Here we go. You're a miracle worker. 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 You're a miracle. You're a miracle worker. Jesus is still a healer. Jesus, you're a miracle worker, Lord. You're a miracle. You're a miracle worker. Help me out right there. You're a miracle worker. We love you, Jesus. You're a miracle worker. Right here. You're a miracle worker. Again. You're a miracle worker. You're a miracle worker. You're a miracle. You're a miracle worker. You're a miracle. You're a miracle worker. Do that again. Say you're a miracle. You're a miracle worker. He still works signs and wonders. You're a miracle worker. Hey, take me out right here. You're a miracle worker. 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 Here we go. Say is. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything? Is there anything too hard?
can we just talk to the Lord for just a moment? God, we worship you today, and we give you all praise. Amen, amen. It's such a good day to be in his house. Amen, such a good day. I'm so thankful to see every single one of you here. Why don't we give our guests a good hand? We're, we're delighted for all of our guests that are here today. Amen. Amen. We have, we have many that are out today uh, for with fall break coming up, and many that are leaving town this week, and so we will keep all of them in our prayers this week. Amen. You may be seated. And we have several announcements today, but before I get into that, I want to ask Sister uh, April Shepherd. She's going to come right now and, and talk to us for a few minutes this morning. I ask that you give her attention. Good morning. I have an exciting announcement today. Um, and it's not that I'm pregnant, so <laughs> <coughs> just thought that would be fun. All right, so I'm announcing today that we're going to start doing a baby bottle project to raise money for Tennessee Right to Life. And so you can take one of these bottles home. Maybe the kids want to grab one and ask the grown-ups to fill them up. Or you can take them home, put in bills and change in order to raise money for Tennessee Right to Life. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just wanted to read quickly um, a, a letter from the Tennessee Right to Life representative, Diana Meinweiser. She said um, thank you to the pastors and for our church to support this culture of, of life in our state. Um, maybe everybody knows that abortion is federally legal throughout all nine months of pregnancy since 1973. Um, so as much as legally possible, it's up to individual states to promote the protection of life. And so toward that goal, Tennessee Right to Life has worked alongside uh, legislators and the nation's best pro-life constitutional attorneys to draft and enact common sense protections which saves the lives of children in our state and um, so I wanted to tell you about some of those one of those is the omnibus bill there's the abortion pill reversal act both of those are from this year 2020 informed consent and a 48 hour waiting period there's the Tennessee Infants Protection Act um, then there's a uh, in 2018, Tennessee lawmakers permanently redirected f taxpayer funding away from Planned Parenthood. Uh, yeah. And then there's the Human Life Protection Act. And I'm going to leave this letter out, out in the foyer alongside these bottles so it goes into more detail on these different le pieces of legislation if you're interested in reading more about them. Uh, all of these... Laws are important steps to building a culture of life in our state. This year, uh, the goal of Tennessee Right to Life is to work with about parental involvement laws regarding abortion. Right now, abortion facilities can direct girls to circumvent the parental consent law that was passed in 1995 by directing them to pro-abortion judges who rubber stamp these requests for abortions without the knowledge of any um, parents or other relatives. And so if this legislation is successful, then it will help save hundreds of girls and unborn children from the hurt and harm of abortion each year while preserving and protecting the right of parents to be involved in these decisions. Um, so also, you know, there's a lot of harm that goes along with abortion, not just for the child, but the person who carries that weight. And so that's, that's part of what we're talking about there. There's several ways that we can all be involved. One is through prayer. It's an important issue to pray about. Um, speak up for the voice, voiceless babies. Um, be informed of the crisis of abortion in our nation and worldwide. Call your legislators and ask them to work with the Tennessee Right to Life. To, uh, to pass these life-affirming laws and several other ways. And then the one that we're working on today is the, the Baby Bottle Project. You can, if you want your gift to be de tax deductible, then there's this little, it looks like a bookmark inside, and on the back you can fill out that paper and just put it in your bottle when you're finished and turn it in in two weeks. Then they'll send you a tax deductible statement. So let me leave us with one scripture. 
Matthew 25, 40. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. And so certainly these are the least among us. Um, so let's fill these bottles to support Tennessee Right to Life. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Shepherd. Amen. If, and this is going to be loud for just a second till they get me adjusted. But um, I'm so thankful for Sister Shepherd uh, bringing this to my attention and asking if we can move forward with this. Um, this is something, especially with the election coming up, this is very, uh, very real and very applicable right now. We, we are literally voting for life. We are voting for life, and, um, and I'm, I'm thankful for, for people such as her and organizations such as Right for Life that are willing to, to step up and, and say, hey, we, we need to sponsor this, we need to support this. And so thank you, Sister Shepherd. Can we give her a hand one more time? I thank her so much. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, once again, she mentioned about praying for our nation. And uh, we meet here on Tuesday nights as we pray for our nation. And uh, that will continue this, this coming Tuesday night. So we ask you once again, if you can gather here at 730 p.m. here in the sanctuary as we continue praying for our country. And our next community prayer event is October the 24th at 6 p.m. That once again will be in our parking lot. Um, last time we did this, we had some right near the end of it. People just started pulling over on the side of the road and walking down there and asking questions. And so we got contact and information and we're letting them know ahead of time that when this next one's coming up and, and we're hoping this, this will continue that way, that we can continue to make contacts and continue to let our, our city and our country know that we are praying for them. We hope to see everyone here this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and uh, excited for all that is going on here in the classes that we have available. Um, we're also excited about starting our Sunday night services back. And uh, amen, excited about that. That starts, starts this evening at 6.30 p.m. Uh, with Brother Jacob Kaiser preaching for us this evening. Amen. And uh, he's, he's been preparing and, and getting ready all week, and I know he's going to do a tremendous job. Excited for the way God is using him uh, and the calling on his life. Once again, as we, as we did today with our service, Sunday school at 10, uh, service at 11.15, Sunday night service at 6.30 p.m. We'll continue this format moving forward. So next Sunday morning, we're delighted to have guest speaker, Brother uh, Jeff Moses, will be here preaching for us next Sunday morning um, in our 11.15 service. Tremendous, this preacher, if you've never heard Brother Moses preach, I encourage you to come. There, I, I, there's no finer preacher, in my opinion. He, he is a, a, I've heard him referred to as a preacher's preacher, uh, but he is, he is a, a phenomenal man and friend of mine. Um, of course, we, most of you know him. He, he pastors in La Follette. And uh, so he will be with us this coming Sunday morning. Uh, a few events to, that are coming up later this month. First off is our Hallelujah Party on Wednesday, October the 21st. This will take place at 6 p.m. And our theme is Paul's Shipwreck. Uh, I, first time they told me that's what it was going to be, I said, Paul who? You know, I was trying, I was trying to think Paul, Paul's Shipwreck. Uh, then all of a sudden it clicked. I was like, oh, Bible theme. I was thinking Wilson, like a volleyball. And I was, I was, trying, to try, I was trying to piece it all together. So Wilson's coming with me. He's going to be my friend. But um, so the question, the question we asked for 2020 is, is your life a shipwreck? Um, and if it is, you should come to the Hallelujah Party because we're going to put it all back together for you. Now, <laughs> but once again, we want you to take a break and bring the whole family. Uh, and we're going to have fun on the island as we eat dinner, play games, have fun with the costume contest. And dinner, once again, is just $2 a person. Um, and before this day comes, we'd ask you to consider placing some candy uh, in the front lobby. And um, I, I spoke of, of this on Wednesday night, and I'll do, it, I'll do it one time here. It may be a little silly, but we know, of course, what all happens at the Hallelujah Party. One of the most competitive sporting events yes. that takes place. In, in, in all the year, I know we got football and we got all these other things we watch, but this, this is the most competitive sporting event that takes place this year. Some actually wait 364 days without really living, just waiting, just existing for this day. An event so rare that it's become almost unheard of. With social distancing, it's become almost extinct. However, on October 21st, someone will leave with the title. 
The title coveted by men and women and children far and wide. The title that many covet but few ever possess. The title of the balloon stomp champion of 2020. Amen. Previously in our competition. The past two years, 2018, we all know was a ferocious battle that ended with David Trentinella taking home the title. The balloon, that, that, that very balloon from two years ago still hangs in front of the men's urinal in the bathroom in between the old, in the old lobby. You can still go in there and see it today. Which, of course, and right beside it hangs the, the balloon from 2019 when Brother Nick St. Sevier, the 2019 and current title holder of the Balloon Stomp champion. And, and, I, and I'm, I wish he was here today because I, I was going to bring him up here and it was going to be awesome. However, so y'all, y'all tell Nick we're talking about him. But um, I, was going, I, was, I, I brought balloons. I was going to have them autograph balloons as people were leaving and just hand them out. So maybe next Sunday. Next Sunday you can get an autograph balloon from our 2019 title holder of our Balloon Stomp champion. However, as you know with everything, there always has to be a twist. I'm going to ask Brother Jake Moulton to stand. Brother Jake Moulton, all the way from California, the church he came from, he was their current title holder for the Balloon Stomp champion. (laughs) So on October 21st, some will come for food, some will come for fellowship. But all will be in, in attendance for our annual Balloon Stomp competition as the West Coast collides with the East. Amen. (laughs) I ain't going to know what hit him. (laughs) Amen. Amen. We have a lot of fun around here. (laughs) Also, just one thing to keep on your your calendar as well is our trunk or treat is coming up this month, October the 31st. And uh, we're collecting candy for it as well. There is a bin in the front lobby. You can place that in. We're also planning to do chili, give away chili as we've done the past couple years. And, and if you were here last year, um, some still have not, Sister Heather Kaiser has still not forgiven me for the weather last year, which I had no control over the weather. I know the master of the wind, but I don't control the wind. And, uh, but it was cold last year. We don't know who knows what the weather will be like. It's East Tennessee. We might be out there in short sleeves at 90 degrees. But we're going to do our best to make it happen. But if you were here last year, we, had, we probably had over 400 guests. We had a tremendous turnout, tons of guests, and we hope to do the same this year, and we want to be a blessing. So if you, if you would like to decorate your car and are planning to, we ask that you'd sign up. Uh, whether you want to decorate a car, if you're, playing, if you're bringing chili, if you could sign up and let us know what you're bringing. And also, if you say, I don't know how to make chili and I don't like decorating cars, we can still find the place for you. So we, we will use you in serving and doing other things. So if you, can, if you want to be involved, just let us know. And we're excited about our, our trunk or treat this year on October the 31st. Amen. All that's behind us now. If you'll stand, <laughs> I'm going to ask our ushers to make their way. And we're going to give you the opportunity to worship through giving this morning. Amen. If you would, lift your hand. I'm going to ask them to put our prayer on the board and pray with me now. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given back to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, Debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and walking with God. Perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? God, we thank you, Jesus, for what you do.
We love you, mighty God. Amen. We invite you to march and give your tithes and offering this morning under the direction of our ushers as the music plays at this time.
Jesus, say the name. Answering God. Amen. I, I, I know we've been praying for Brother Walter Bogue, and, and uh, as I made known to you some, some weeks ago, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he's been undergoing tests and scans trying to see how far it has spread or what, where it's at, and, uh, and I'm thankful to report that it has not spread anywhere in his body that is contained in one location, which is a tremendous answer to prayer because we serve an answer to prayer in God. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Right now in this place, mighty God, mighty God, hallelujah. If you would mind standing this morning in honor of the reading of the word of God. We're going to go straight to his word this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1. First Chronicles chapter 12, I'll read verse 1 and 2. And it reads, Now these are they that came to David to Ziglag, while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your spirit that is so evident in this place. God, I thank you for all that have gathered here today, Lord. God, I know you have a word for us this morning. God, I thank you for what you're going to do in advance. Lord, we praise you, mighty God. We worship you today. And I pray that we would take this truth, take your word, apply it to our lives, live this truth every day. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. 
in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. This, this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, uh, do a little bit of a study. Something, I'm going to do something that people have spent millions of dollars to research and to prove. And I, and, and I think you're, I'm going to get you to help me uh, prove this, if this is all right. So here's what I'm going to ask. If you were right-handed, will you please stand this morning? All right. All right, you may be seated. Now, if you are left-handed, would you please stand this morning? Don't be ashamed. It's okay to be left-handed. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> right, right-minded, that's right. He's in his right mind. <laughs> that's debatable. Anyways, you may be seated. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> and my, my, my little girl's left-handed as well. And we just did it. There, we, we proved. Because studies show that 80, about 80% of people are right-handed. And about 20% are left-handed. So congratulations. We just solved the crisis of which people have spent millions upon millions of dollars researching to see if more people are right-handed or left-handed. Now, now I'm going to ask one more thing. If you are ambidextrous, could you please stand up? All right. There are a few. You may be seated. <laughs> Some are running in. Amen. And, and studies show that even fewer are, are truly ambidextrous. Ambidextrous is, is being able to, to use both hands with, with equal use. Um, I'm sure if, if any of you watch baseball, uh, there, some of the most talented baseball players are those that can bite, bat either right-handed or left-handed. Uh, growing up, we, we grew up watching the Braves, and uh, Chipper Jones was my man. And I, we got some guys fans, but <laughs> I loved it because he'd get up there and depending on what, which hand the pitcher was throwing with would determine which side of the, the plate he'd stand on. And what was crazy is he could hit just as many home runs as he could left-handed. It didn't matter. You could throw anything you wanted. He could hit it. It didn't matter which way. And I, that always fascinated me. And I was like, man, it'd be, it's cool that he could use either hand to accomplish what he wanted. And, and, and so, you know, they're able, they're able to change based on the circumstance. Whatever the circumstance, whatever circumstance presented itself, they could adjust or change because they could use either hand equally. And so this morning, I entitled my med- message simply ambidextrous. Judges 3, 15 says, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud the son of Gera, a, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And I'm going to jump all the way down to 21. And it, and it said, this is, this is Ehud. He had went before the king, an enemy king. And it said that he put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Once again, he was able to, to, to smuggle a, a dagger in because he was able to use his left hand versus his right. You see, in the ancient world... Left-handed people were often forced to be right-handed. You weren't allowed to be left-handed. You, you, it, for whatever reason, it, for, some, for some reason, left-handed people were kind of looked down. So they would try to, when a child began using the left hand, they would restrict it or try to force a person to be right-handed. Most pagan nations uh, in that day viewed left hand as, as weakness. As, as we all know, the right hand represents power and authority. You see that in scripture about the, the standing at the right hand of the throne. Or you hear the terminology, somebody saying, well, this is my right hand man. Um, and so they often took that as the left hand being the opposite of showing weakness. Judges 20 and 16 says, among all this people were 700 chosen men left handed. Everyone who could sling stones at a hair breath and not miss. We read about, and you read about these 700 men and they, they were they're referred to as men of valor. Um, and the thing that all these, these people that we just read about, that were either ambidextrous or sometimes it's referred to as, as left-handed, the one thing they all have in common is they all come from the same tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. These, these were Benjamites. And oftentimes they're referred to as left-handed, 
even though what they were truly were is they were ambidextrous. Because the Benjamites discovered that being able to use the left hand as well as the right hand gave them advantage in war. Every time it refers to these men being left-handed, it's always in the context of war. It wasn't that they were painting a picture and they used their left hand. No, it was, it, it was a battle, and they were men of valor. You can read about the Benjamites, and even when, uh, even when they, they were on bad terms with God and the children of Israel came against them, they had very few men. They were able to, to, to slay many, many more men than what it should have taken to come in and kill them. But they had the ability to use the left hand. Um, like I said, for those that are not ambidextrous, how good are you with your opposite hand? Like I could, I could take a ball right now and I could throw it to David Sparks and hit him in the chest with my right hand. If I tried with my left hand, I'd probably take out Sister Mel. And so, <laughs> it, so you don't want me to throw with my left hand. Uh, that's, for the most part, that's, that's where we stand. Uh, we're, we're able to, to use because we're comfortable. I'm comfortable with my right hand. Uh, me, me and Brother Jeremy, sometimes we go play disc golf, and I can throw right-handed all day long. If I try to throw left-handed, it's not going to go well. I look like a three-year-old out there trying to throw a Frisbee. It just, I, I don't, I, for whatever reason, I can't, I, I, but it's because I haven't, I haven't trained my left hand. It's not that I couldn't become ambidextrous. It's just not something I've put focus on. And so the Benjamites realized that most of their enemy was training against a right-handed men. And if you train your whole life fighting an enemy that's right-handed and you show up and all of a sudden your enemy is not, can, can fight with either hand and they pull out a sword with their left hand, that, that, it's like throwing a curveball and all of a sudden it's what we've never, we've never faced this before. This is something we didn't expect. We, we, we came prepared and we had trained and we were ready and so it would leave their enemies at a disadvantage. You know, once again, they're, they're, such a disadvantage because it would give, amb being ambidextrous would give them such a great advantage over their enemy. Now I want to get to my main, my main text this morning. I did all that to build a foundation and see who's ambidextrous and there are a few weirdos in here. So we're going to move on. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And I'm going, to, I'm going to read and I'm going to make some comments as I make my way. Uh, to my point, I don't plan to keep you long this morning. We actually, we're excited to get to baptize the sister Vicki Clark this morning. And so, and I'm also excited because we, we baptized sister Caroline Harris on Friday. <laughs> and so, God is doing great things. And, uh, but Nehemiah 4 and 1. And I'm actually, I'm going to re read it from the ESV, and you can read it in the KJV. It's just a little, little clear in some parts. But it says, now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they re restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of, of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So this is what the enemy was saying. And so Nehemiah begins to pray, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from before your sight. For they have provoked your anger in the presence of the builders. And so you see ne Nehemiah's response. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't try to, he didn't go debate with his enemy. He didn't form a committee to go try to appease to them and say, no, no, no. He didn't retaliate. He took it straight to God in prayer. He heard everything, that, and we should use that as a great example. That when our enemy taunts and when our enemy begins to throw out things at us, when they begin, even when they're beginning to threaten of attack, that's still not a time to go and retaliate. That's a time to pray. Because Nehemiah realized that, that without God, they didn't have a chance. Without God, they did not have a chance. And, but, but I love verse 6. So he, he hears what the enemy says. He begins to pray. And then verse 6 says, so we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together 
half its height, for the people had a mind to work. God answered the prayer by giving them all a mind to work. So I, I got a couple things here. I'm going to pull out of here in a second. So I've got a hammer. This is not the Sunday you want to fall asleep. Um, <laughs> so here, <laughs> Scripture tells us that they had a mind to work. They prayed. He said, you know, we, 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 you know, we're, we, we don't know what to do here. You know, we ask that you would uh, encourage our builders, that you would give us strength. And the scripture says that they, they all, for the people, had a mind to work. I, I don't know if you realize that that is something that comes from God. You see, you see that same thing, a mind to work. We also see that in the book of Acts. When they were gathered together in one room, in one mind, and in one place. You see, when the people had one mind, when there was one mind to work, they were able to accomplish what their enemy said, you'll never do. How, how is that going to happen? You're never going to be able to do that. You'll never be able to accomplish that. And the fact of the matter is, that probably would have been true had God not given them a mind to work. It took them in, in, being willing to submit. It took them being willing to say, you know what, I'll pick up a hammer. Hey, I, I'll, I'll get to work. Let, 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 me, let me begin to work on the wall. I, I, want, I want to get involved. I want to be a part of that. I want to help build. Because as you continue reading Nehemiah, what it, he ended up doing was he said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. You go build the wall in front of your house. You go fight, what, you, When you get up in the morning, you walk out of your front door and you go work on the wall that's in front of your house. That's for in protecting your family. And so they begin to work. They could, they could work on the whole wall at the same time. And verse 7, so we kind of keep going back and forth here. So first, he, we hear what the enemy says. He prays. God answers, and they're able to, to begin, begin building because they had a mind to work. But then verse 7 says, But when San, Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that they heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, we started with just a couple enemies, but now, now, now he's listing five different, five different enemies of na or nations that are saying, hey, and, and what got their attention was not that they were living there, not, not that they had, that they had you know, come back and, and built homes. No, they heard that the building of the walls in Jerusalem was moving forward. It was the progress was being made. When progress began being made, and, the, and Scripture says that the breaches were beginning to be closed, that they were very angry. Their enemy became very angry when they heard that, that the, the Israelites were making progress and that they were moving forward. And so when they found this, when they discovered this, verse 8 says, and they plotted together or conspired that they and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. The ESV says, and to cause confusion in it. The enemy, their plot, their plot to stop progress, their plot to stop the work from moving forward was to create confusion. That, 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 that's a that's a tactic Satan has been using for a long, long time. That, that, that is an important strategy of Satan, is to create confusion among the people of God. We, 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 can, we can go back and, and we can even see, you know, once again, uh, uh, where, where confusion has been created in the Israelites all, all throughout Scripture. We know one time they, a king paid, paid a priest to come and bless them, and he couldn't bless them. But he was able to say, you know what, here's what you do. You can go down there and you begin to, to, to mingle. You begin to, to show compromise. And the next thing you know, they, they, they'll, they'll follow over to you. All, all of a sudden, he was able to, to destroy them from within because he created confusion. He begins to hinder the work. And Satan is all he, he loves because, once again, he does not want to see the work of God move forward. Yeah. He never wants to see God's... As long as he can keep it, as long as he can keep it in one, in one little box, if he can keep it inside four walls, he's okay with the church residing there. He's okay if we gather and we stay right here and it doesn't grow and we don't go anywhere. And instead of becoming fishers of men, we create a, a comfortable aquarium where we come and, and we can reside 
but we're not gaining, we're not growing, we're not moving forward. That's what Satan, he's okay with that. But what he can't stand is when a church begins to move forward. He can't stand when, when the children of God begin to grow, when we begin to mature, when we begin to move forward, when we begin to build. Because when that happens, he begins to try to cause confusion and distract. And once again, because he, he's, he's fine with distracting people because it keeps them from having to fight them. Because here's the thing. I don't know if you read the back of this book. It says, I win. So why, why would he try to fight us? If we have a guaranteed victory according to the word of God. So what he can do instead is distract us. He can cause confusion. He can hinder us. And so verse 9 it says, And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, in Judah, it, was, in Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to. To rebuild the wall. See, the halfway point is a dangerous place. They've been working for, for many, many weeks at this point. And it seems like, you know, we, we've worked and worked and worked and it's still, it's still not done. And the enemy is still, still hindering us. There, and fatigue begins to set in because so much work has already been done. But it isn't just enough to, fin- to, to start well. We can't just start well. We, we, have to, we have to finish well. You see, many, many a team have had first great halves. No pun intended about two yesterday. Uh, but the rebuilding, the rebuilding work has gone very great. And many obstacles have been overcome at this point. But the job still isn't done. And so they got to a place where they got so tired and so fatigued. Because it, was, it wasn't just building a wall. There was a lot of rubbish that had to be removed. That's what took so much time. The rebuilding of the wall was not only about the construction, but it was about cleaning, cleaning out the rubbish and hauling away the rubbish and getting array, getting all of this stuff out of the way to build a new wall. Because the ruins of that wall had been lying there for for 100 years and had been collecting all kinds of rubbish. And in our lives, nothing much can be built uh, um, for God's glory unless we first remove the rubbish in our lives. Before God can begin to really do something with us, it takes us being able or willing to work and say, I got to get this rubbish out of the way. There are things here that that are hindering me from growing. There are things that I don't need right now because if I set this aside, it's going to make more room for God to build what he wants to build in my life. But sometimes taking out the garbage can be discouraging work. Sometimes when we get in that rubbish moving and we're just going through and just trying to figure out and plowing through that, that's tough work. I, I, I realize that. Because once again, that's looking in the mirror. That, that's dealing with the one person that's hardest to deal with. I, I, I don't know about you. I can deal with other people. But it's harder for me to look in the mirror and try to figure out how to fix this guy. Because that requires a lot more work. That requires me removing rubbish of which I placed there. But I have to remove it and I have to be willing. And, and once again, and, and they said, by ourselves, we're not able to rebuild this wall because it takes Jesus. It takes God to help us because we know that through him, anything, anything is possible. When we work with him and and, and we do this together, we're able to accomplish so much more. The same when we come for the work of the Lord and when we, as the builders, unite and work together, we can accomplish so much more than any of us could accomplish on our own. Verse 11, I'm, 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 I'm getting, getting there. We'll be there in just a second. It says, and our enemies said they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So enemies, once again, they're just, they're just talking a lot of smack here. They're saying, we'll be in there and kill them before they even see us coming. And it said, and at that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lower parts of the space behind the wall and open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, their bows. And, and I look, look, looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. 
at this point, the work had stopped. It, it had become stagnant because of everything that was going on around them. Because of what their enemy was saying and because of the confusion that was around them and the things that were hindering the work. And all they could hear was the voices of what was going on outside of their walls. And it had slowed down and stopped the work to the point where they, they, were, they, were, they were so confused and they were so afraid. They didn't know what, how they were going to move forward and what was going to happen. They became so discouraged because of the way their enemy was talking. And Nehemiah rises up and encourages the people to, to, to not be afraid because they had the Lord with them. The Lord was on their side. He said, you, 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 got, you got to get your hammer back going. You got to get back to work. The Lord's going to fight for you. You got to keep working because the Lord is going to fight for you. But we must continue working together to accomplish our goal. And he reminds them that the Lord is going to fight for them. And he's going to fight for their sons. And he's going to fight for their daughters. Fight for their wives. Fight for their homes. Everything that should matter to us in this world. He said, the Lord's going to fight for all that. He's going to take care of all that. He said, but we got to get back to work. We got to keep moving. We've got to keep working because there is work to be done. And so verse 15 in my Bible, it says, the work resumes. And it says, and when our, our enemies heard that it was known to us and, and that God had frustrated their plan. And he said, when the enemy found out that we knew what they were up to and that God had already, had already kind of frustrated their whole plan, they just got, and we, because we all returned to the wall, each to his work. They basically said, we know what you're up to. We don't care. We're going back to work because God is going to fight for us. And from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, half held the spears and shields and bows and coats of mail, and the leader stood behind the whole house of Judas. Well, everybody, see, everybody has a place in the kingdom of God. He said, if, if you ain't got a hammer, you can get a spear. If you don't have that, we'll pitch you here. If We're going to find a place because the work has to continue. So we're going to find a place for all of you. And we're going to continue building the kingdom. Either way, everyone is needed for this to move forward. But here's, here's what, what I want to get to. Verse 17. It says, they which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that, that laid it. Everyone with his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. Now you really don't want to be asleep. So, so here they, they've, they've been working and they, they've been working and working and working. And he says, well, now, now we're going to mix things up. I want you to continue your work. But in your other hand, I want you to hold a weapon. He said, yes, we're, we're going to be prepared. We're going to be prepared for whatever comes. But we're not going to stop working. So you can carry your protection in one hand. But you got to continue the work in the other. And so what the people had to learn to do is, is learn a new way to work. I, I, I doubt any of them had ever built a house with a, with a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. It'd be hard to hold a nail, you know, hold a nail and you try, try to hit that. But all of a sudden they, they said, you know, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the new reality for us right now. Is that we're going to have to learn how to work and protect ourselves at the same time. Because the work has to continue. The work has to continue. See, most feel as though we must choose between protecting ourselves or working. And they said, no, no, no. We, we just got to figure out a new way so that we can accomplish everything. Because you know, our, the enemy, they didn't care if they carried around weapons. If they said, you know what, we're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pull our swords and we're just going to stand and we're going to guard, guard our half-built wall. That's exactly what their enemy would have loved to happen. They were fine if they would have stopped and said, we're just going to protect ourselves the rest of our lives on this half-built wall. That, that, that was good. That would have been, their plan would have succeeded if that had happened. But when they picked up a hammer and they picked up a sword and said, we're just going to learn a new way to work because the work must go on. All of a sudden, their enemy said, from that day forward. And guess what? They completed the wall and the enemy never showed up. They got all kinds of threats. They had nations against them and nobody ever showed up. They just continued working and continued building until the walls were built. Likewise, Satan, like I said, he doesn't care what we do. He, doesn't, he, does, he would like for us to continue on as normal. He was fine with, you know, if we want to continue on as normal, that, that's fine. Because he doesn't want us to spread the gospel. 
to your neighbor. He doesn't want to see the church grow. He doesn't want to see people repent. He doesn't want to see people get baptized like we've already done twice in the last couple weeks and we're going to do again this morning. That is not what he wants to see. But I'm here to tell you that the work at Eagle Bend Apostolic Church is going to continue. We, we may have to change how we do things. We may walk around with something and learn, learn something new in each hand. But the work has to continue. The work must go on. We can't stop. We can't stop moving forward and say, you know what, this is protected. No, we have to continue forward because the wall must be built, because his kingdom must be built. He, we can't allow Satan to accomplish what he's trying to do, to confuse and to hinder and to stop the work of God because Satan is trying his best right now to cause confusion. He's doing his absolute best to distract the children of God. He'll use any means possible. He'll use the new, any news outlet, any media, any person, your neighbor. He'll use people to distract. But we have to be willing to look past the distractions, to, to remove the distractions and continue working on souls. You say, well, I don't like that person. Remove the distraction and work on soul. Because we still, we, that's why we have a weapon in one and a tool in the other. So that we can remove the things that need to be removed while continuing to build and, comp and accomplish the work of God. Because Satan is trying his absolute best to stop everything that is going. He'll use any means possible. He'll use a virus to do so. But I'm here this morning to let Satan know that the work is still going on. The, the church is still growing. The kingdom of God is still being built. So, so do, do what you will. We baptize Brother Matthew. We baptize Sister Caroline. We're going to baptize Sister Vicki. We're going to keep on moving because the work needs to be done. We're going to keep moving forward. We're not backing down. We're not going to let fear stop us. And Because God said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It is upon this rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't know about you, but the only way the gates of hell don't prevail is if we keep beating on that wall, if we keep moving forward, if we keep growing, if we keep doing everything that God has called us to do. I'm going to ask our musicians to come right now. Last verse, verse 23. I'm going to skip a few down. And it says, So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants, nor the men on guard who follow me, none of us took off our clothes. And each kept his weapon at his right hand. And I saw that it jumped off. Do you, do you see what I see? So these men, they, they had been working and working and working. And the scripture says that when they decided to hold a, a tool in one and a weapon in the other, that they kept the weapon in their right hand. Because once again, this would have been their strongest hand. They wanted to, to keep it there. Their weapon was always at their right hand. Which means they would have had to have learned to use their tools with their left. And though they never fought with their sword, they carried it. They always kept it here. They learned to work with their left hand. So his familiar hand is what they kept their protection in. Because th this, this wasn't going to change. This was familiar to them. This was familiar to them. And so they kept their weapon in their right hand. And they learned to work with their left. Which means at first that work would have felt kind of unnatural. It would have felt uncommon. It would have been like, this is not how we usually do things. This is not, this is not the norm. But the more they just continue to work... And continued to work and continued to work and continued to work. The stronger and stronger they became to the point where they realized, wait a second. I, I, I feel just as confident no matter which hand. And all of a sudden what, what the enemy was trying to do in discouraging them only made them stronger. It only gave them more of an advantage over the enemy because now they became ambidextrous. No longer were they just walking around with a tool in their right hand. Now they could, they, could, they could fight and protect themselves with their right while continuing the work in their left. You know, like I said, I can't throw left-handed very well. I can't, I can't swing a hammer very well. But I know I could learn to work. And they, and they were cautious. They carried the weapons to protect themselves. But they never stopped working. Once they picked up and had a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other, they said, let's, let's get to work. Let's get to work because there is work to be done. So no matter how bad this world gets, 
the work of God must continue. Our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. You see, right here, we, we, have, we have the sword of the Spirit. This is all we need. But with this in God, he, he will fight our battles. So as long as we allow and we keep this in our right hand and we begin to work with our left and say, wait a minute, that does, this doesn't seem like what we used to do. It's okay. We can learn new ways to work. You see, had this virus, had this virus not have taken place, we would not have our live stream the way it's going right now. Had that not have happened, we would not have a, a YouTube channel, which didn't start until a few months ago. We started a YouTube channel. One day, Brother Matthew Clark decided, hey, I want to get on YouTube and find out about the apostolic doctrine. A couple months later, Brother Matthew Clark, can you wave at us back there? Oh, he, he's being used right now. He's working. He's in the media booth right now because he learned first with the short. And now he's learning something new to work in his left hand. You see, had it not been for what God, for what Satan would have used to distract us, we used it to just keep on building and keep on working. And I'm thankful that we can keep on working and we can keep on building, even in the face of a virus, in the face of an enemy, in the face of confusion all the way around us. We can keep working and God can keep growing and God can keep building because we're going to trust him today. If you'll stand this morning... What Satan would use to confuse and distract and hinder and destroy. If we're willing, if we're willing to adapt, if we're willing to say, you know what, God, you keep protecting us and we'll keep figuring out new ways to get your work done. You, we'll keep figuring out new ways in which we can work and protect. But God, we're going to place it in your hands. And so today, that's what I'm asking us to do is to, is to be willing to learn and adapt and realize, yeah, it ain't always going to be, com it might be uncomfortable at first. Well, so this is different. I mean, this is different. We used, this is how we did this for 40 years. We ain't 40 years ago anymore. Sometimes we have to learn how to work in new ways. But God is in control. God is in control. This right here, this never changes. I'm not talking about this changing, but I'm talking about the work. Once again, we hold the right in our familiar hand, our strong hand, because this is where our strength, this is his honor, this is his word. But we got to keep on working with this hand. We got to keep on building the kingdom of God. And so this morning, I open these altars, and I invite you to flood these altars. And I want us to spend a few moments. We're going to do a baptism here in a minute. But before that takes place, I want us to take some time and get in touch with God. And God, I want to be willing to adapt. I want to be willing to do what may be uncomfortable if it continues to build your kingdom. God, I want to be used. God, I want to work. Put me back to work, God. God, we need you. We need you, God. Lord, we're going to continue to work. Lord, we need you today. We need you today. God, we thank you for your work. We thank you, God, for what you've given us, for what you're going to continue to give us. Hallelujah. God, we're going to continue the work. We're going to continue to give Bible studies. We're going to continue, Lord, to plant and to water so that you can provide the increase. Lord, we're trusting in you. Lord, no matter what's going on around us, we're not going to listen to the words of our enemies. We're not going to let fear run our lives. We're not going to let doubt run our lives. God, we're going to put our trust in you. Then we're going to keep on working. God, we love you today. We love you, Jesus. past is over in you, all things are made new, surrender my life to Christ, I'm moving, moving forward. I'm not going back, I'm moving ahead, I'm here to declare to you, my past is Amen, amen. God, we're going to move forward. God, we're going to...
to continue to move forward. God, to build your kingdom, to do your work, God. And we're going to do it together. One mind, one accord. God, we love you this morning. And we thank you, Jesus, for your spirit, for your anointing, for your power. I commend all of you for continuing the work. I commend all of you for being here this morning and for continuing to move forward, continuing to be here, continuing to support the work of God and working for it. And like I said, we, we've got events coming up and days coming up of which we can use every person that wants to be used as we continue to work, as we continue to build upon what God would have us do. Amen. I'm going to let them get up here and Still your mic. So thankful for Sister Sister Vicki Clark making this decision. have Brother Gary Gwynn pray over her. Thank you, Lord. Let's all pray. Lord, thank you for this soul. God has decided to take on your mighty name, the name of Jesus. Bless her, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you've already filled her with your spirit, that Holy Ghost power. Now she, God, has taken on your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Sister Vicki, on confession of your faith and according to the word of God, I knew I'm right now I'm going to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you've already received the Holy Ghost. We're going to pray God will refill you in a mighty way right now in Jesus' name. no better way to end a Sunday morning service than with a baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. God, we love you tonight. We love you. Amen. Hallelujah. Once again, we thank all of you for being here today and uh, looking forward to our evening service at 6.30 p.m. with Brother Jacob Kaiser preaching for us. I, I hope all of you will come and be a part of that as we kick off our Sunday night services. Thank you for being here today. If you would, lift your hand one more time as we pray in dismissal. Dear Lord, we thank you, God, for what you have done here today. 
Lord, I thank you for your spirit that is in this place. God, we thank you, Lord, for the soul that has been baptized in your precious name, God, for the sins that have been washed away by your blood. And, Lord, we give you praise today for what you've done and for what you're doing, Lord. I pray that you would bless your people as we leave this place today, and we give you all the praise in the wonderful name of Jesus. We pray these things. And everyone said amen. 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 You are dismissed, and God bless.